I usually start soft, so I'll get louder in Charlottetown. I have to build my confidence a little bit. Uh, in my lecture yesterday, um, we talked about the problems and dangers posed by discursive imperialism, a discourse which, according to Edward Said, attempts to define our terminology and tell our narrative, in this case, as Muslims living in the West. So here's the bottom line. If the West really wants to understand Islam, and when I say the West, I'm not just talking about non-Muslims living in the West. The West and Islam is not an absolute dichotomy. We have to stop being so binary. We are the West. One of my teachers is an American convert. He was in a Starbucks and he was wearing a kufi and a man in front of him turned around and said, are you wearing that thing on your head because you're a Muslim? And he said, yes. That man said, you're a traitor. He walked out. Since when is Muslim the opposite of American? What is an American? What is a Muslim? If the West really wants to understand this deen, this way of being in the world, then it must, we must acquaint ourselves, we must acquaint ourselves with our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. If you don't know the Prophet, then you don't know the Islamic tradition. That's the bottom line. If you don't know the Prophet, you don't know the Quran. Kana khulukuhu al Quran. And anti Muslim bigots, they know this really well. You can call them Islamophobes if you like. Uh, they know this well. That's why they're constantly trying to assassinate the Prophet's character, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's an age-old tactic. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And if you knew the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would know that his message is universal. Ana Sayyidu waladi Adam wala fakhar. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm the master of the children of Adam and I do not boast. Qul ya ayyuhan nas, inni rasulullahi ilaykum jami'an. He is a messenger of everyone. He said, there is nothing in the heavens and the earth that does not know I'm the messenger of God, except the rebels from the jinn and ins. And oftentimes this cosmopolitan aspect of his message is misrepresented and termed as Islam's global agenda, right? This is to create fear. Who threatens you with fear, according to the Quran, is Satan. That's from Satan. So this rhetoric of you know, Muslims are going to take over the planet. It's going to be planet of the apes. Right? They're secretly planning on usurping power from Western nations. You know, makes for a good mini-series on Fox, I guess. We we're talking about this yesterday, the effective media pedagogy. If t television is your main source of religious education, then you have a problem. And you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. I promised a brother yesterday I'd quote Ice Cube again in my talk, so I, I had to do it early, get it out of the way. The Muslims, you know, we're not the ones meeting once a year at the Bohemian Grove, the Bilderberg Hotel. We meet at, at risk here, and our doors are open. We have nothing to hide. It's complete transparency. We say, marhaban, ahlan, musahlan. You don't need a trust fund. You just need an open heart and an open mind. And if they weren't so loud outside, I'd actually invite the Christians inside and listen. But mashallah, the man has a voice like a megaphone. So I don't know if it's going to be prudent at this juncture. Um, and I made a mistake one time of actually approaching one of these hardcore evangelical Christians. I was at a church one time and we were having an interfaith dialogue. And when I walked out, a group of them kind of just ambushed me, right? So I approached one of them and she said, you know, it was a woman, so I, so I thought you'd be more reasonable. And uh, so she says, uh, your prophet went into Europe and slaughtered all of the Europeans. I'm like, wow, I don't, I don't know who you think my prophet is, Napoleon or someone. To so, know it's very well documented. I said, oh, uh, he never left the Arabian Peninsula in the 23 years of his, of his prophecy. And then she proceeded to quote a verse to me from the Quran that ostensibly or apparently advocates violence. So I quoted a verse to her from the Bible which apparently advocates violence, out of context, right? In order to demonstrate her erroneous methodology. So I quoted from Luke chapter 19, verse 27, in which Jesus is reported to have said, those enemies that do not accept me as their king, bring them hither and slay them before me. Right? In another translation, cut their throats in my very presence. And I expected her to say, well, you're not looking at the context. Right? And then I would say, oh, of 
course, that was my point. But she didn't say that. She said, that verse is nowhere in my Bible. <laughs> so I said, can I see your Bible? And then I just kind of flipped it open, <laughs> and it was right there. And she closed the book, and she looked at me, looked down back at the Bible, looked at me again and said, I know who you are, Satan. <laughs> Sometimes you have to put the fun in fundamentalism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the universal aspect of the Prophet's message when he says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Global mercy, not domination. Hearts and minds, not lands and resources. Universal in the sense that this tradition recognizes and accepts our distinctiveness with respect to ethnicity, country, culture, language, clan, tribe. It also transcends these designations and uh, distinctions by offering us a unifying uh, spiritual identity called Muslim. And there's no country called Islamistan, right? I assure you. There's no Christendom either, right? I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, are you Islam or are you from Islam? Right? So what is a Muslim? A follower of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he himself was a Muslim. So how do we deal with that? The Quran says that the sons of Jacob, the Bani Israel, they were Muslim. The Quran says that the disciples of Isa Alayhi Salam were Muslim. This is a transcendental spiritual identity. So here's what I'm saying. There's always going to be a level of hybridity in our identities. We're all hybrids. And we should embrace that. Don't fight it. Embrace it. Don't think that you have to put yourself into a box. Am I Afghan or American? Am I Indian or Canadian? Am I Muslim or American? No, we should forsake this black and white binary framework. We find it annoying when people do it, to, do it to us. Why do we do it to ourselves? Our sisters know about this. People slowing down their speech because they assume you're an idiot because you wear a hijab or you don't understand English, right? It's very annoying, right? Or, they're, you know, someone's forcing you, so they, they, have, they have pity for you. Some, some husband, some father, some brother is forcing you because no one in their right mind would wear a hijab, right? So they're trying to fit you nicely inside of a box, but you're not so easily definable. You're highly nuanced and non-Muslims as well. We have to be careful in our interactions with people. Zayn al-Abidin said, Inna Allah khaba'a wilayatahu fi khalqi. That Allah has hidden his awliya amongst his creation, not fil muslimin or bain al-muslimin. In his creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hid or concealed his, his friends, his awliya. So we have to be very vigilant as to how we interact with people, whether they're Muslim or not. This is common sense. So embrace your hybridity, explore it. There's nothing wrong with being hyphenated. You can be a Muslim hyphen uh, American or a American hyphen Muslim, wherever you want to put your uh, emphasis. And what does it mean to give precedence to your faith over your country? What does that entail? Is that a bad thing? I asked five Christian professors at a Christian seminary. I said, which of these two takes precedence in your life? The fact that you're American or the fact that you're Christian, which takes precedence? And five out of five times, with no hesitation, they said the fact that I'm Christian. It's obvious. And what's wrong with that? Nothing. Because they know that their national identity, their nationalism, will ultimately die with their bodies. Right? But the soul will endure. The angels in your grave will not ask you whether you're from the East or the West, whether you were a Democrat or Republican, whether you prefer Coke or Pepsi, or whether you were on Team Jacob or Team whatever, I don't, I don't even know. I just exposed myself. Some of these designations are important for the dunya, but ultimately they will die with your body. Man Rabbuka, who is your Lord? Wa what is your religion? Waman Nabiyuka. Who is your prophet? That's it. Embrace your hybridity. But know, but know that, that above all, you are a Muslim. I am an Iranian-born 
American, Sunni, Muslim, Hanafi, Ash'ari, whose strongest English, whose strongest language is English. Anyone else? I'm usually the only one in the room. Wallahi, I've never had, because I've heard a lot of theories out there. Is he half Jewish? Is he? Is he he's, a, he's a Kurd. Wallahi, I've never had an identity crisis. You want to define me, you can just call me Muslim. So let's look at some of the best of exemplars. The Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he was an Israelite from Bani Israel. That was his ethnic distinction. In Exodus chapter 6, we are told that he's from the Bani Levi, which means a Levite. That was his tribal distinction. He was born in Mitzrayim or Misr in Egypt. That's his national distinction. He spoke ancient Egyptian and ancient Hebrew. That's his linguistic distinction. His wife was Zipporah, the daughter of a Midianite priest. So his children were half Arab. Look at the hybridity, look at the diversity. But what was his spiritual distinction? His spiritual distinction, what was his transcendental identity, right? Now, I hope I don't offend anyone with this. But if we can travel back in time, 1400 years before the common era, some 3400 years ago, and we can ask the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, I asked him, are you a Jew? He would say, no, I'm a Levite. Because in his day, the word Jew meant a descendant of Yehuda, of Judah, like David was from Judah, but Moses is from Levite. In, in other words, he would think that I was referring to a tribal distinction, not the name of a faith. If I asked him, are you a practitioner of Judaism? He would not know what I was talking about because this word Judaism as a concept wasn't coined until the 8th century before the Common Era, after the Assyrians attacked the Northern Kingdom of Israel in 722, and apparently 10 of the 12 tribes were wiped out. The only two tribes that remained were Benjamin and Judah, and Judah's the older brother, so they called themselves the Jews. Our contention is that the spiritual identity, the spiritual identity of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam was Muslim, one who peacefully submitted to God. The word Muslim is transcendental. Right? It's, it's a, 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 anachronistic to call Musa alayhi salam a Jew. Uh, the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, who was born in Bethlehem in Judea, the Roman occupation. He was raised in uh, Galilee, Nazareth, um, in northern Palestine. He spoke Syriac, which is a language that the Israelites uh, adopted when they were in captivity in Babylon. He also spoke Hebrew the language of the synagogue liturgy, and probably spoke Koine Greek, which was the language of the Roman occupiers. So there's a lot of hybridity. Now, obviously, the prophet Jesus wasn't a Christian. The book of Acts tells us that believers in Jesus were first called Christian when they were being expelled from the synagogues in Antioch. It was originally a derogatory term. The earliest Semitic Christians called themselves Nazareans or Evionim, right? and they considered themselves actually a sect of Judaism. Our contention is that his spiritual identity, the spiritual identity, which is overriding everything, was Muslim. And he says in the Beatitudes, in his mother tongue, and this is obviously from a fourth century um, uh, translation of the Greek manuscripts called the Peshitta. In his mother tongue, he says, Blessed are those who make peace. If you were to translate that into Hebrew, it would be Baruch HaMashlimim. Blessed are the Mashlimim, which is the exact cognate of the word Muslim in the accusative case. In Judaism, the Nasab or the lineage is taken from the mother, it's matrilineal. And all other tribes except for one, the tribe of Levi. And Maryam is Ukhta Harun, she's a Levite. She's a descendant of, of Aaron, of Harun alayhi salam, right, who was the first high priest. The Gospel of Luke also says that she was a Levite. So in that tribe, tribal distinction is taken from the father, only in that tribe. So Isa alayhi salam's tribal distinction would be whatever his father's was. But Isa alayhi salam doesn't have a father. Therefore, Isa alayhi salam, when you think about it, it's not really from Bani Israel. وَرَسُولًا إِلَى Bani Israel. He was a messenger sent to the children of Israel. This is why he's never quoted in the Quran as saying, Ya Qawmi, like every other prophet says, Oh my people, because their father is from that people. But Isa alayhi salam says, Ya Bani Israel. 
So usually when I make this next comment and there's a mixed crowd of Christians and Jews and whatnot, I say, hold on to your hats and your hijabs and your hair pieces. When I tell you that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was essentially a Muslim and in the nation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was from a tribe called Quraysh. His clan was Bani Hashim, spoke Arabic. But he was in reality a citizen of the world. And I believe that he advocated what philosophers today call a rooted cosmopolitanism. In other words, to act locally, but think globally. To think of something outside of yourself. Like when he said, Seek knowledge even to China, thinking outside the box. So many of us will say, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to look weird, right? You know, beard and the, the kufi and hijab, is, it just seems weird to me. You know what's weird to me? When I was in junior high, there was a fad, apparently, a trend where you would wear your clothes backwards. You guys remember that? I guess there were some, <laughs> some guys, some, some artists who were doing that, who wore their clothes backwards. That seems really weird, you know? I don't, I don't know if I'm coming or going, I guess. I don't know. Or wearing jeans so tight that you can tell if a quarter in your back pocket is heads or tails. <laughs> this young brother who's you know, 18, 19 years old, he, he, uh, he started growing his beard and he, and he came to me and he was in tears and he said, you know, my friends at school, they made fun of me and so on and so forth. I said, you know, brother, one day you're going to look back at this and you're going to laugh. I'm laughing at you already. <laughs> I have to put some humor into it. Right? So weird is actually a matter of perspective. I mean, there are Christians in the Muslim world. You go to some churches in the Muslim world, you think you're walking into a masjid. You see people standing and bowing and prostrating. They're reciting litanies in Arabic. You take some of those Christians that are in contemporary Middle East and you bring them into like a Joel Osteen convention at the Staples Center. You know, this idea of the prosperity gospel. And those Christians will say, this is so weird. What are they doing here? What are they talking about? And those are also Christians. So it's not a Muslim Christian thing. It's this postmodern opulent lifestyle thing. That's weird. For the people of faith, being weird to the postmodern world is actually a good thing. And I'll end with this. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna dina bada gharibana. This religion began as something strange, as something weird. And then it'll, it'll return to be something strange. So glad tidings to the strangers or glad tidings to the weirdos. So if loving Allah and His Messenger is weird, then I don't want to be normal.